Season 4 of Notebook on Cities and Culture is brought to you by Daniel Murphy, Polar Inertia, a journal of nomadic and popular culture online at polarinertia.com, and Medivate, a community and set of tools to help you build the kind of meditation practice you'd like to have, online at medivate.com. Just a few days ago, my girlfriend had some German friends visiting. They were going across America, and they came to Los Angeles, and I asked them, what, when you were in Germany, did people say you should do in Los Angeles, or what did they say to prepare you? And they said, well, they said, first first people said there was nothing here, and then they said, well, Hollywood Walk of Fame, and and the Santa Monica Pier, and maybe maybe Griffith Park, and that... That, I take it, is not an unusual reaction or not an unusual summary of Los Angeles to hear from a foreign visitor, right? No, that's pretty common. Most of the time it's, you know, how many celebrities have you met? Everybody, that's all they really know. And it's kind of unfortunate because actually this city was really created by Germans and French people and not just not just Mexicans and Spanish people and we are a melting pot actually um, there's a lot of French people who live here uh, Olvera Street used to be called Vine Street because it was entirely filled with uh, wineries and there's so much history people don't know what they really know is what they see in movies and what they see on TV which is not necessarily the reality for people who live here It's Notebook on Cities and Culture. I'm Colin Marshall, coming to you from the top of the Hotel Wilshire here in Los Angeles, speaking with Lynn Garrett, proprietor of the very popular website and Facebook community Hidden Los Angeles, digging into Los Angeles from various different angles, geographical, historical especially, but also cultural, social. Every possible way you can examine Los Angeles, you can find somebody doing it and talking about it on Hidden Los Angeles. And tell me, I... I want to get a sense, because you, a while ago on Metafilter, uh, asked what people hate about Los Angeles. I want to get a sense of some of the patterns, uh, some of the patterns of the perceptions you collected there. Well, a lot of them are, it's very similar. It's that it's dirty. It's that all it is is concrete. It's that there's no green space. Everyone, again, is Lindsay Lohan and Paris Hilton. Um... You know, everyone is here to be an actor. Everyone is self-absorbed. Everyone has plastic surgery. And, I mean, the fact of the matter is that I I am a fifth-generation resident of Los Angeles. And my family, you know, this is is where my family was. My great-great-grandfather is buried in Forest Lawn. And there is so much history here that has been around since even before Hollywood. And the people that come here are passing by it at high speeds without realizing all the heritage and history that, you know, it's not like L.A. just suddenly started existing and and it only has one industry. The majority of the people who live here actually don't work in the entertainment business. There's no way a city could exist without the people who work, you know, for the electric company and the people who, you know, are administrative assistants and dentists and, you know, it... It is a home to a lot of very normal people living lives that have nothing to do with what the outside world thinks L.A. is all about. It, it makes me curious. I mean, I wonder, uh, I'll try to make this make sense as best I can, but these perceptions that stick, that Los Angeles is all concrete or that you sit on the freeway all day or that there's no history or, or that there's no green space here, no, no culture here of, of note, what are they sticking to, sort of emotionally, or what? What? What human need are they filling that they that they're so that they're so persistent? These notions, even though they're fairly easily argued against or disproven. You know, hum, human beings are strange. Uh, we're strange creatures. Um, it, it's especially. I, I mean, I run the Hidden Los Angeles Facebook page. It's got like two hundred seventy-seven thousand people on it, um, which is a lot of people, and. There's this tendency, especially nowadays, for some reason, to just want to be negative. Um, to just, if somebody will, you could show a picture of a puppy and someone will go, you know, puppies are the end of the world. You know, someone has to troll. Someone has to say things like that. 
And unfortunately, a lot of people, they kind of do that. They have this need to troll in their own lives in a way. And again, kind of, you know, you live in this city where there actually are a lot of amazing things to do and amazing places to go and amazing people. There's so much going on here and people will go to work, come home, go to work, come home. They'll just watch cable TV and they don't even know what's at the end of their block. And I think a lot of the things that keep people from kind of going out and exploring is fear sometimes. And what I try to do with Hidden LA is show that there's nothing to be afraid of. You know, there's other people are just as they're a lot like you. Um, this city is a lot like any city filled with good people, bad people, you know, good things, bad things. And you have to find what you, the city will be whatever you want it to be. If you want it to be fun and exciting, you can find that. If you want it to be horrible, then knock yourself out because it'll rise up to meet you. There is a certain amount of discomfort with a city or any kind of place that will be whatever you want it to be, where the, the, the onus is on you to craft the experience, isn't there? Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of people... When I was living in the Bay Area, I kind of said to somebody that, you know, in, in Los Angeles, you, basically you are your own salvation here. And other people, like your neighbor, unlike a lot of other places, your, your neighbor is not necessarily judging you. You are kind of responsible for your own experience here and for your own stuff. It doesn't mean that people don't care about you. It means that, you know, you can build your own support system. You can find your own path here, but no one's going to do it for you. And for a lot of uh, a lot of people, that's terrifying because it's, you know, it sounds scary. It sounds like a lot of work. But actually, if you once you start kind of getting used to that, it's really freeing and it's really fun because it makes it an adventure to go out and find your path here. It's not always easy. That's the other thing is, you know, it's I don't think I think every city has their moments where it's hard. You know, I don't think that's unique. Um, I think everybody's lives have moments where they're hard. But there is a treasure trove of stuff here if you actually decide you want to get out your little metal detector and start looking for it. What does it take for people to want to get out the metal detector, do you think? Um, I think part of it is opening up your mind. And it's it's so easy, especially if you're, you know, if you if, if you're having a hard time or whatever, it's easy to kind of let that grow and to kind of go, oh, everything's horrible, everything's horrible. And it's, it's hard. You have to make a conscious choice to go, you know what? Maybe it's not so, but maybe I should look around. Maybe. And one big thing right now, um, the Los Angeles River is a good example of that because um, we have a big revitalization going on for the L.A. River. And I've been doing tours of the LA River for about three years, and just this morning put on sale a bunch of kayak uh, trip tickets for that. And it doesn't matter how long I've been doing this, there's always somebody, when I post this, who wants to say, oh, the LA River, all it is is dead bodies. Oh, the LA River, all it is is, yeah. You know, it's, it's just, I, I would never go there, because all it is is dead bodies and gang members, and all it is is this and that, and they want to be negative. The problem is that that it doesn't benefit you to be that way. It may make you feel for that moment like you're really cool and you're telling everybody that, but it's not going to make your life better if you think the place that you live is a horrible place. And the fact of the matter is that the, the crime rate in L.A. is the lowest it's been since the 60s. A, a, lot of, a lot of folks will go, that can't be true. They, can't, they must not be counting this. They must... Eh. Why not just go, wow, that's great. Why not try to believe the positive? There, there is a sense people want a mirror for their anxieties here, don't mm -hmm. they? If, if they're afraid of crime, the river is all gang members. If, they're, if, they're, if they hate driving, then all you do is sit on the freeway in Los Angeles. It's, it's, they want to see whatever is worst come back at them. From, from here, uniquely, they don't ask that of New York necessarily, even though there are complaints aplenty from New Yorkers about New York. No, well, I think that actually it's not people from here necessarily who are doing that as much as, uh, I mean, people here, yeah, they do. But a lot of people around the world do that. And, and, and part of the problem is 
they just see movies and TV. And and that's all they really, you know, I, I was in Egypt and, you know, I was living in the Bay Area and people around me were all asking about the movie Con Air. Specific, was it during the heyday of Con Air or no. was it? No, it's, you know, they see movies later on in see. other countries. Um, and, you know, when I, when you go out, they get these things kind of stuck in their head of what, what L.A. is. And, like, there was another thing that always gets brought up for the L.A. River is there was a comedy sketch with Conan O'Brien where he, he kayaked down the L.A. River. Well, it was a comedy sketch. So they picked the, and he'd also just come from New York. So his love of L.A. wasn't quite, you know, really really there he was trying to make fun of LA which is easy to do you know especially if you're not from here so he kayaked down the LA River in the worst section you could possibly kayak just to show you know and so all of these people think that that is actually the reality not realizing that there are three soft bottom sections filled with birds and fish and and plants and you know there's there's kind of a, a pushback on wanting to think better of the city and of the government a lot of people here too anytime there's a new project like a new park or something um you know if if there's a new park people will be like well that's going to fail because people need to be they need to be fixing potholes Uh, you know and it's like just no way would the funding for a park be competing with potholes (laughs) it's just you know that's just the way people sometimes are and the fact is there is so much here. How, how much of it can we chalk up to the fact that there are nearly 500 square miles we're dealing with, and you can't really think about Los Angeles all at once? You, you can't conceive of everything in a mental picture because th- 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 there is so much. What uh, What is that responsible for? Well, the, the thing about the size of L.A., I mean, that that's, it's, that's what's tricky about it. It's overwhelming um, and... It's sometimes it's easier than trying to understand something that big and that overwhelming. It's easier to just go, well, that stinks. I, I don't like that place. That's horrible. Because it, it takes away, you know, like we we're saying, it, t- it takes away the energy that you have to put into something if you just give up on it before you even try. And it seems like too big of a task to get to know L.A. So what I generally tell people, and this is something that um, should be better known, is that Los Angeles is not really a city. You can't compare it to other places where there's a one city center and you know and if you are doing that then you're not going to you're going to be disappointed because that's like comparing, you know, why a horse isn't like a cat. You know, they're totally different creatures. LA is more like a country filled with a lot of villages. And each village has its own heritage, it has its own history, it has its own uh, the, the type of people that it draws. It has the certain activities that it's best for. And what I recommend to people is to explore little villages, each of these little villages separately. And then once you get comfortable with the little villages, you'll find that they all together are what makes up L.A. Have you always, to some extent, even if a small one, had the impulse to actively explore Los Angeles? Or did did it start more recently for you i mean was was it always there somewhat oh yeah um basically when i was a little kid my uh I, I stayed with my grandma a lot and she lived in van nuys and my grandmother um well my my great grandfather and my grandfather used to paint murals at charlie chaplin's house and they you know we had a lot of history here and my grandmother when she was 19 preached with amy semple mcpherson at the angeles temple actually before it was a temple when it was they were preaching in like revival tents during the depression and before and um when the temple was built she babysat amy something mcpherson's kids and so she used to tell me you know when i would hang out with her um she'd always tell me all this history um and you know oh this used to be there i remember this and then when i finally was kind of on my own um when I was in art school, I went to art center and I was a broke art student, like all art students. And, um, I remember just filling my tank, uh, before I would get food. <laughs> Cause you know, I was, I was young. I had good metabolism. Uh, before I would get food, I would fill up my tank and I would once a week just start driving and I would pick a street 
and I would just park my car. I didn't have any money, so I would just walk up and down the street, and I would walk into every store. And, you know, this was before the riots and the earthquakes and the fires and the floods. So I went everywhere, and I didn't know not to. So I, you know, I made friends all over the place, and I explored all over the place. And that's kind of how I first got to know L.A., was just by doing that. I still do that. There's something that I told these the, the German visitors that that, uh, that I mentioned at the top of the interview that don't think of places so much as think of streets and explore the streets. It sounds like that was the plan you were on in the art school days. Was you would you would take Los Angeles, uh, you would take streets as the organizing framework. Well, that's a tricky that's a tricky way to look at it. Um, I, I would say more. Blocks, blocks than street because there are some streets in LA that go on really far yeah. they go on 30 40 miles and like for example if, if we're talking about sunset <laughs> you know sunset goes through Bel Air all the way to the ocean but it also you know it'll go through down to East LA to Echo Park and downtown um, before it ends and there's there are certain streets that sometimes especially tourists will have a little problem with this they'll be like oh I've seen this street name before, you know, and then they end up driving through Inglewood and they don't realize why La Brea, you know, went through Inglewood, you know, went down to Inglewood. So um, I wouldn't necessarily say following streets. I would say there are certain blocks of streets and certain, it's still with the villages for me. Even if a village doesn't have a name, you know, and you just pass, if I pass a block and I think it looks really interesting, um, I will totally do that um just park and just walk around and i found more amazing things that way once a visitor has in mind the the, once they're thinking about los angeles as a constellation of villages and that's the framework they're working with what else what else should they bear in mind as to how to as to how to look at it how how to process it differently on sort of the macro level than other cities a good question. Well, I think right now, actually, a lot of people process LA differently than they do other cities to its detriment, in a way, because, um, you know, as, I, as I've mentioned, it, it, people will come to LA, they'll get a hotel by the airport, then they'll rent a car, they'll go to Hollywood Boulevard, park at Hollywood and Highland, which is the last place I would recommend you go. Sorry, it's my pet peeve. <laughs> go, to the, go to the farmer's market, you know. But, um, no, they, they'll go to Hollywood and Highland, and then there are, okay, th- there'll be guys walking along the street saying, hey, you want to get in this unmarked van and have me show you Hollywood, and we'll show you Stars Homes. And people will pay them and get in these unmarked vans. In no other place in the world would a stranger coming up to you, trying to put you in an unmarked van and getting them to pay for it, be okay. Right. And it's not okay um, for me at all. So then they'll be like, oh, I went to L.A. and I had a, you know, a star tour and it was horrible and I, my hotel by the airport was horrible. It's kind of like, you know, going to New York, getting a hotel by JFK, going to Times Square, um, buying a watch off someone and then going home and saying you saw New York and you didn't like it. Um, what I would say is find out, you know. First off, go on Hidden Los Angeles and feel free to ask questions of me and, and of the crowd there because it's trying to make a big city smaller and, and it's people who live there, also a lot of people who grew up there, um, just talking about what's great and what locals actually like. Um, I tell people, if people say they want to get a uh, hotel room at the airport or on Hollywood Boulevard, I beg them not to. I, I say, you know, get a hotel near 3rd Street or near Farmer's Market and then you can walk to all these places and and you can there's like seven museums within literally within two blocks of my home there's seven museums Um, go to an area that is a place the locals like to hang out don't look for Hollywood because to be honest you're probably going to see more celebrities in a place like Farmer's Market than you ever will in Hollywood and Highland because Farmer's Market, which is, it basically has been there since the 30s and it's a lot of food stands and it was originally a place where um, the farmers would come and they would sell fruit off of the back of their vehicles in the, you know, and then it kind of 
started getting structures. That is private property, and so paparazzi can't go there. So if you go to eat at Farmer's Market, you're more likely to see a celebrity in there because it's their safety zone. And and, and they'll be there with their families. Don't bug them. Um, then you are if you go to Hollywood and Highland and take a star tour. How important would you say it is to, not to totally ignore, but to sort of minimize one's focus on the, not Hollywood literally, but Hollywood and the celebrity culture and the industry when exploring Los Angeles. I mean, just to, to make, how important is it to keep one's interest in that, uh, to, to hold it down so you can see the rest of the place? I think pretend you're traveling to any other major city. I mean, if you go to Paris or if you go to New York or whatever, when you go there, you want to find out what kind of cultural stuff do they have? Um, you know, what types of shopping, what types of interesting things. We have, I think it's like 180 museums here. We have some of the most amazing uh, museums in the world here. I mean, we really do. The, the Getty and the Getty Villa are fantastic. LACMA is fantastic. The Craft and, Folk, Craft and Folk Art Museum. I mean, we've we've even got a bunny museum, and all it is is literally this lady has a house full of, of things that are rabbits. I mean, we have crazy stuff here. Um, there's just, there's a lot more to do than walk around trying to see Lindsay Lohan because really she's not, she's not even from here and she's not the best part of the city. So um, th there's just, there's so much depth here. There's so much history. The, the laser was invented in Malibu. You know, there's, we've got the space program is here. There is so much depth that... If you start looking, you start finding out all these things that you really didn't even know were, you know, were here. Interacting with the Facebook community, how much, what, what sense do you have of how it breaks down, how many people live here, how many are from other places in America who've left Los Angeles, how many are people who want to come here or, or, or international residents who, who are interested? What sense do you have of roughly how that breaks down? It's a good question, and I actually know a lot about that. So, um, it's it's a really, really great demographic. It's about fifty five percent female, which is very rare because usually on the internet it's a, a lot more women, especially on Facebook. Um, and I've figured out it's about forty percent of the people that are on the Hidden LA page don't live in LA locally. But it's a, it's comprised of a combination of things. It's people who grew up here. And moved away. It's people who um, who want to come to LA on vacation or are thinking about moving here. It's people who are they, they're interested in LA. And they know nothing about it, or maybe they think they hate it, and they're kind of come on the page to prove that I don't know anything. That happens sometimes. And we also have a lot of soldiers that are in Iraq and Afghanistan. Oh, really? And, and what it kind of is is that I, I know that when I was living outside of L.A., I would have been uh, on the page. Because when you're away, you don't have anybody you can necessarily talk to about all these things from your childhood and all of this. And, and on the page, there's all these people who, if, if someone says, you know, Cal Worthington. Everyone knows who Cal Worthington is. There's these little flash points of memory and a collective memory and everybody shares. And there's all these little, you know, arguments people can all have about the red car or whatever. Yeah. Um, but also for the soldiers that are in Iraq and Afghanistan, it's their sense of home. So, you know, they're out there in the desert and they go onto the page and suddenly they're back home and they know what's going on in the city if there's like a new park if there's you know if a, if one of their favorite we just had some some restaurants and bars that are closing that are kind of historic and they know what's going on when they come back they feel like they're still in the loop it's a sense of place what, what are the topics about los angeles that really that come up on the facebook page and you know there's going to be you know, you're going to have to control it a little bit. There might be a firestorm. There might be big arguments. There might just be giant threads. Things might get out of control with which topics about Los Angeles. Well, the L.A. River is always one because there's always people wanting to troll those. Oh, there's always the... Um, Why do they hate the river so much? 
You know what? I, I, it's not that they hate the river. It's it's really strange. We have a strange relationship with the river, and and the reason is that you know we had this 51 mile long river, and it would change course all the time. And we decided, you know, we liked Northern California's water better. So when we got the aqueduct, the Army Corps of Engineers. They kind of never met a bag of concrete they didn't like. So they said, you know what? We had some really bad floods. We'll fix it. We will put our source of fresh water into this big, long culvert, this concrete culvert, and we'll just send it out to the ocean to get rid of it as quick as possible, which, you know, doesn't really make sense. But um, so when they did that, we're basically a city that lost their river because a lot of, for many, many years, um, if you ask someone where the river was, it's a 51-mile river, and they couldn't tell you where it was. So now there's all these programs to, you know, take the concrete out and all of this, and, you know, it's hard for people to accept change. And, and, and especially, you know, the 90s were not a great time in Los Angeles, and there's a lot of folks who lived here in the 90s who they have these memories, and they have a hard time letting go of... They have a hard time letting go of the idea that Echo Park is not gang central anymore. There is such a fear of hipsters and a fear of gentrification, you know, and and sometimes improving a neighborhood, you know, it, it doesn't always equal that, you know, there's a storm, the, like the hipster stormtroopers are coming and they're going to get rid of everything that is good in the world. Um, that's really not, it's not that simple the way that it works. When my mom was growing up, there were a lot of places, a lot of restaurants, a lot of things that by the time I came around, they weren't around anymore. And we're going through that. And, and that's hard for everybody when stuff changes. But when I do a lot of the research, everyone wants to say it's, this, you know, it's the hipsters, it's this, that. A lot of times people get very upset about change of any kind. And it's natural. Case in point, when, when businesses close and people get very upset about that. Um, human beings only live a certain amount of time and they die, unfortunately, and they get sick and they divorce. They make bad business decisions. They leave things to their children who screw it up. Um, they have fights with their landlord. And when a business has been around for 70 years, it's hard to keep businesses open, you know, continually or if the customers aren't there anymore or whatever. So I think change is the hardest thing. That's the moral of the story. Whether it's the river or businesses closing or trying to accept, you know, things getting better. It's, it reminds me of, you know, whenever I write something about Los Angeles myself, if it's about, say, the we, we've called them hipsters already, but that, that sort of presence in a place or whether it's about... Oh, if it's about that, someone will say you must hate hipsters, you must love hipsters. If it's about driving, someone will say you must hate driving. Oh, you must love driving. You, you must be you must be pro subway. You must be anti subway. If I but the, the thing is, people will say both things when I've only. I don't think I'm. People try to put you on the side of yeah. of everything in Los Angeles. Do you think that's true? Oh yeah, they, it, yeah. I think that there are times where um, I mean, my main concern in general is. There's a lot of really bad journalism out there. I hate to say that, but, um, you know, it, it used to be that our local papers were just doing this. I mean, they were doing international stories and hard-hitting stuff. I mean, the Times still does a lot of things, but, you know, the, the LA Weekly used to get Pulitzers. It was an amazing go-to resource. It was where everyone would go to for what we were going to do on the weekends. It, they did these hard-hitting news stories and stuff. And... Um, it's kind of become, you know, I had a, a conversation with somebody who had written an article, no names, uh, and I was, you know, that was making jokes about the LA River, and I said, you know, I don't know that that's really helpful, you know, to make these jokes about the LA River because they were stereotypical jokes within within a news article, and and they said, well, I'm just making a joke, and you know, people like a little comedy, and and I said, well. I, I don't think people are coming to these resources and these news sources um, for comedy. They're believing you. And to say, you know, to say, oh, well, it's their fault if they don't get it. That's not true. We are representing. And I, I feel for me that it's not necessarily my place to take sides a lot of times. It's my, it's my job 
to try to present the truth as best I can, or at least different people's versions of the truth. Um, there are times where people will say, if, if I say certain things like, for example, there's a streetcar uh, going in downtown and they want to they wanna make on Broadway so that there's a lot more pedestrian area. And I was saying, okay, this is the reason behind what they're trying to do. And I said, you know, there's been a lot of car accidents. There's been this. And then folks will sometimes kind of act as though, well, you're stupid if you think that. I'm like, well, I'm not saying I think that. I'm presenting these facts to you. Um, The more, what I found is the more research I do into a lot of things, um, the harder it is for me to be black and white about a lot of topics because I, I find out that the stories are more layered and there's more detail and more depth to them. More interesting, therefore. Yeah, they really, really are. But it's against, I think especially in the internet culture, um, it's against people's nature to stop and read the, the facts behind things and formulate a, a kind of nuanced opinion and have a dialogue um, it, it's unfortunate but what people kind of want to do is just yell you suck at each other right. Right. and I try to discourage that there's a lot of people who, who uh, I, I, get, I get a lot of flack for that but um, uh, I get a lot of flack on the page uh, for having an opinion when I do have it but I find that when I don't comment and I don't moderate and I don't say my opinion, the actual um, traffic on the page goes down by 70%. 70%? Yeah, That's hard to believe. It does. It, you know, there's so many websites and so many, you know, YouTube and, and so many Facebook pages where it's all just a bunch of people ranting at each other. <laughs> yes, indeed. You know, and self-promoting and all this kind of stuff. Um I, I think it's um, important, even though it's the hardest part of the job, I think it's important that there's a back and forth and a two-way dialogue. And that um, there are times where folks will come on the page and they'll just, they won't read the article, they'll see the topic, and then they'll do a big long rant. And I'll read what they say and I will reply to them. Sometimes they don't like that because they, they're like, how, how, why are you responding to me? Right. You're not supposed to come out from behind the curtain. No, no, no. I'm, it's supposed to be a monologue. And I'm like, no, this is a dialogue. And if you're going to say a bunch of stuff that a lot of it is not researched, a lot of it's not true, and and um, you're going to say it to, you know, I, I have a page of 20-something thousand people. Um, people will read what you're saying, and they will repeat it. And I want, when I can, for the page to be a place where... There's a dialogue, but at least I try to present, to the best of my knowledge, the facts behind stuff. You, you do talk to, you reply to some of the people, as you've said, on, on the Facebook page, but I wonder if you adhere to the same rule I do on the Internet, which is a solemn vow not to actually engage in an argument, per se, on the Internet. Do, do, you, do you follow that? Um... <laughs> I can be a little snarky sometimes. I can be a little snarky sometimes. I, you know what? The, the thing about it is, though, that it it's. I always try. I my main rule is don't insult people personally. That's where I have an, an issue with it. But the fact is, there's a lot of trolls out there. And what I found was when I didn't respond, they would feed off each other and it would grow. So I have a tendency to, I say things as respectfully and as patiently as I can, but there are some times where there's only so much abuse a person can take or should be expected to. And I'm not a corporation, so I'm not like representing Tide and I have to, you know, make sure I don't say anything that would, Tide would fire me for. I'm representing, I'm representing Hidden LA and Hidden LA is, is really me and if I'm wrong about stuff, I will totally apologize. Um, in no way do I want to argue with anybody about anything. The most I will usually do is people will start arguing with each other, and I'm like, cool it, knock off the expletives. And then they'll start arguing with me, and I'm like, sorry, 
homeschool it now, you know. I, I have to kind of rule with an iron fist a little bit because that's the only way to keep a quarter of a million people in a conversation. Right. That's the, 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 the quality of civility is becoming one of the most valued things and hard to cultivate things on inter- internet forums. I mean, you mentioned Metafilter and they've traded on that a bit that they're a little better about that than most, most venues. But uh, that seems to be... That's kind of the golden calf, isn't it? Is, is some measure of civility. If, if I hadn't been on Metafilter, I don't think I would have been able to do this. Really? No, because I had been on it for a while, um, and like their rule of no self-promotion, and yeah, I actually when it when Hidden LA first went viral, I had, I had uh, written Jessamine a couple times, going, "Oh my God, I had no idea." what you go through I'm <laughs> so sorry for any part I ever had in any bad day you ever had right. you know because it's so much more work and so much harder than people realize and when I first started um, I immediately did the no self promotion thing because I'm not sure if you know this but there's a few people in LA that are kind of self absorbed I mean I've heard this, I've heard a rumor there might be one yeah. um, two maybe yeah. two, 12 yeah, something uh, so initially when it went viral I had to do something because uh, it became a lot of, I love tacos. And people thought that, you know, back then, uh, you know, they were used to Twitter where it was just you could say whatever and people were supposed to be fascinated. So they were all over the wall with, you know, I just farted, you know, whatever. And it's like, that's fascinating, but what does that have to do with the theme of this page? I had to get very, very clear on the branding and identity of exactly what the point of the page is. And, you know, then it started being where people would come on and say, come to my one-man show, I'm Hidden L.A., you know, come watch my band, or, you know... We're not very well known, we're hidden. Yeah, and it, it became this self-promotional wall, so I had to stop that. And then, then it also became, um, you know... This, there are sea turtles dying and you need to post about this because sea turtles are dying I'm like are they Los Angeles sea turtles are they you know is there something uniquely LA history or place about these sea turtles no and then I would get you know sea turtles are going to die because of you it's on your head and so one of my one of my really good friends calls me the turtle killer yes, yes. I mean, and the, the axe grinding inevitably if you don't keep it away comes to you yeah. and it's gotten better it's really gotten better because people uh you know it's been four years of doing this and and they're used to the rules now and you know, some people still fight but it it was really bad in the beginning it it was a lot of this is facebook i can say whatever i want to you can't tell me what to do you're a horrible human being and and the first year, uh, it was really, really hard. And then you kind of, um, you know that, that Honey Badger video? Uh, yeah, I've heard of them. I've seen a bit of the Honey Badger, honey badger yeah. video, yes. I, my friends, you know, that's one of the things is I've kind of become a little bit of a Honey Badger. So <laughs> you have to. It was either your skin gets thick um, or you quit. Right. Yeah. And I've been called a Nazi libtard more times than anyone needs to. I've been I've been called a Nazi a lot. I've been called a lot of things. And after a while, you just have to go, there is a reason I'm doing all this, and it's for the good of the page, and it's for the good of the people who, for all the people you lose, who rant and flame out and get mad at you, the people who are there... Um, a lot of them are have a stronger connection to you for doing that. Right. They, they're there because the, the ranters are gone. No, they're yeah. not here. Excellent. That said, they all come up to me in person and go, remember that guy who did that thing and then you got in that conversation with them and then he said this and he called you that and then remember you did that? That was awesome. Uh, yeah. So, you know, huh. on one hand, some of, the, some of the train wrecks are... You know, hard days for me, and I, I'll get all upset about them. But when it's over, people loved it. Yes. Um, the drama was, was something for Yeah, them. we had one recently where... Do you know who Chef Roy Choi is? I do, yes. The Chego fella. Yeah, yeah. And he did uh, the Kogi Taco truck and all of that. And, um, and he's a celebrity chef, you know, he's a good guy. And I was at Chego the other day. And sometimes when I see 
I don't know if you saw this post, but sometimes when I see uh, someone who's an iconic Angelino, I will just take a picture or a video of them, and I'll be like, just say hi to Hidden LA, right? Oh, yes. I'll just do that. Well, well, Roy is a bit of a troublemaker. He's a rebel. That's just who he is. So he picks up his business card, and he just flips off the camera. You know, he, he just... You know. And my first reaction was not being offended at all because he had a big smile on his face but that's just him and that's himself he was being himself and it wasn't meant to offend or anything it that is who he is and i was in his place and that is who he is and and so i didn't make any apologies for it or anything i mean it would be like if anthony bourdain flipped you off right it's kind of an honor if anthony bourdain flips you off i feel the same anointed you yeah i feel the same way and um he just let his guard down for a minute. I thought that was kind of good. So I posted it, and, oh, there was, who is this person? Why is he doing this? And I have never, I'm, we will never go to his restaurants again. And I'm like, you know, actually, what he's, the, the way he acted and what he's doing with his finger is so much less offensive to me than the way some of the people on the Internet talk to each other. Yes. It's more civil, certainly. Yeah. Um, you know, it's just a finger. It doesn't, it doesn't really bother me. But that day I was kind of stressed out about it and when it was all done all these people came to me and were like that was great yesterday you know and so sometimes the controversy it feels bad at the time because I'm stressing out trying to keep everything kosher but it's exciting for the page and that's part of what people are on the page for is the fact that they never know what I'm going to post and what is going to happen now you mentioned being away, taking some time away from Los Angeles in the Bay Area for a few years. What what brought you to the point where you wanted to pull up stakes for a while? Riots, earthquakes, fires, and floods. Nineties. Yeah, yeah. It was it was just too much. I mean, I I uh, you know I was here in I had a great time in the eighties here, and um, this was a hard time for everybody. And and also any, anybody who says that. LA is, you know, hard to live in or complains about crime or anything. I, I, I don't know how you could say that having been here in the 90s. There are places I go all the time and I, I've i never felt safer in LA. And um, it, it's it's honestly, I'm just so glad the 90s are over. I can't even tell you. It was it was scary. I mean, and I, I had some bad riot experiences. I mean, that I will never forget. And um, it was it was scary for me. I, I didn't. I missed. You know, I told you how it, when I was in art school, I used to drive around and I would just park and go and explore. I couldn't do that anymore. And I used to give tours to friends and and other people, and nobody wanted tours of LA anymore. This was a war zone, and you know the gangs were rampant. It was scary, and, and the news was scary. Everything was scary. And everything is so much better now. What, what do you, when do you point to as the turnaround? I mean, was it literally 21st century begins, uh, things get better? Or what, what, what era seems, what was the beginning of this? Well, I think my turnaround, I mean, I left in 2004. Um, I went to the Bay Area and I'm an art, I was an art director and I was designing children's books for Klutz Press up there. And um, for me, you know, I left in 2004. And I came back after my dad passed away in 2008. And it had already started. And, and I started Hidden LA in... Um, I'd come up with the idea in 2007. Um, and then I started the blog in um, June of 2009. And then it went viral in, in February of 2010. Literally in three weeks, it went from 3,000 Facebook followers to 137,000 people. And that the Burning Man world had something to do with this, right? It was a combination of things. Uh, you know, uh, uh, what the main thing was, was the whole, you know, this many of your friends likes this on Facebook. Um, that was that was really the catalyst, because as more people liked it, there was this peer pressure. And I'm very lucky that my previous background was as a branding expert. So I knew to pick a good name. I knew, you know, I designed the logo. I knew that I had to have a clear identity. And I did everything very carefully as though if I was hired to do it. 
and it, since it had a clear identity, it was kind of easier for people to, you know, latch on. I never once invited anybody to like it. I never once told anyone to like it. I never did a press release. It was all organic. I would say the actual first people that I could thank for this would be jazz musicians because I um, was a jazz musician on the side. I was a singer. And I have a lot of friends who are jazz musicians. And they have a lot of Facebook friends because they want people to come to their gigs. Sure. So when a few of the jazz musicians liked it, because um, I got a good name, and they liked it, and then they had a lot of friends who started seeing it in their their feed. And then it went from the jazz musicians somewhere along the line went to Burning Man community. And once the people in Burning Man started posting it, they have a lot of friends too. So... Then it just kind of exploded. So, the, but February 2010 was the big, the big explosion. Which led you to think, what, as soon as you saw what was going on? Holy crap. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, it was, uh, my friend, my friend Anthony, I was actually doing a, a photo shoot um, for a job on one of the days that, you know, it just went viral. And I was, I was working with him, he was a photographer, and he... He says I was shaking oh, geez. Um, because I, we would go take some pictures and then I'd come back and I'd be like, 10,000 more people just liked my page. <laughs> and, he, you know, I had a lot of people congratulating me. The little me. globe in Facebook is blinking 10,000. Um, no, it was just I would be looking at the number, you know, and I'd be like, oh, my God. You know, and, and the number just kept going up and it just seemed surreal. It was literally every time I refreshed, it was, you know, 1,000 people. And... The, the thing about it, I had all these people congratulating me. I'm saying the word people a lot. But, uh, That's what they are. Yeah. I had a lot of folks congratulating me, and I didn't know what to do with that because to me, um, you know, I, I know enough to know that four million people are Facebook fans of sleeping. Yes, yes. It's not like... You know, so how much does it mean in some sense? Yeah, I mean, it's not like sleeping is, you know, making money off of this and sleeping is posting regularly, you know, they just like sleeping. And, you know, I do too. Uh, what's not to like? But for this, I, I realized instantly that, okay, so all these people are here. That's not the hard part. The hard part is what do I do? What do these people want? So what, what now factor? Yeah, what where what do I do with this? What where do I take them? What how will I not break this? That was a big thing in my head was how you know whatever is going on I, I I can't break it. How am I you know how am I going to keep from breaking this? Yes. And and also it's a lot of work to to try to please a quarter million people is really hard and especially when they're you know they, they'll point out all my typos you know if you having until you've lived you haven't lived till you've had a quarter million people point out your typos um but trying to trying to make five people happy at once is difficult but then you know how to make a living and do that and you know and also the other thing is what is my responsibility to these people and to the city um, and I, I've been really lucky. I mean, I've I've been able to use this to actually do some good, and that makes me feel great. I mean, uh, when the temperature changed and, and got lower um, in fall, I was able to post for. There are these people who um, they work with um, an organization called Monday Night Mission, and it's just a bunch of individuals who go to L, go downtown. They make sandwiches and they feed the homeless on Skid Row. Um, every weekday. The only days they're not there are the holidays because nobody needs help feeding the homeless on the holidays because that's when everyone goes down there. So they're down there as individuals all the time. And when the temperature started changing and, and getting it started getting cold, I did a post asking for blankets. And within a day or two, uh, 300 blankets were, were distributed throughout Skid Row. And, and likewise, when there was a um, there was a tuberculosis outbreak down there, and we got uh, we got people to donate tuberculosis masks, and they were the only people who were distributing masks to the people on Skid Row, and so I, I, it's been really good that 
I know that I have this ability sometimes. It doesn't always work. I mean, that they're really great. People, the people on the page are really great about the um, Monday Night Mission requests whenever I have them. But there are times where if a bar is closing, people are way more upset than if I'm asking for help with, you know, after school uh, programs or something like that. People get really upset when bars close. Yes, indeed. Um, but another thing is Kane's Arcade. Um, the, there's this little boy who had a cardboard arcade that, in Boyle Heights in his dad's auto parts store, and he'd never had a customer. And um, Sky Nirvan decided he wanted to, he met him and thought he was adorable and wanted to do a film and bring him a flash mob of people because he'd never had a customer. And so I posted on Hidden LA because he's we have mutual friends, and 200 people showed up. Then he made the movie; it went viral within six days. And um, now Kane has a $250, $250,000 uh, scholarship to go to college, and is the youngest person represented by William Morris Agency. <laughs> he makes more money than I do. Oh my! But I've been able to do stuff um, with the page. You know, likewise with the L.A. River stuff, that I feel is good for the city and is good for people. What What do the followers on Facebook or elsewhere, anybody you're getting feedback from, what do you think they can they can or they have taught you about the city, about the, the ways to look at it, or about what's here, or is there a way for you to learn from them? I constantly learn from them. I mean, the thing that I really feel is there's no way one person can know this city. And so it's not my view of the city. It, it, that's not what it's about. I mean, I, I'm constantly going to things that, to be honest, I don't even care about. Just because I know someone will. And then I end up learning from those experiences. You know, there's, there's times where something is not necessarily... You know, I've, I get people recommending things or recommending places, and they just sound interesting, and I go check them out. And then what's really great is when I'll go somewhere... And I'll find out that the people behind the scenes are Hidden L.A. fans. And then I get to see the backgrounds of stuff. You know, I mean, I, I get to see some amazing, amazing things. I've, you know, I, I get to do tours, you know, behind the scenes of the Natural History Museum. I've been, you know, zip lining and kayaking the L.A. River. I, I get to do a lot of stuff that um, it's it's just pretty great. And I... And I wouldn't be able to do a lot of those things if it wasn't for the fans of the page. Tell me, what do you what do you learn as well from the travel that you do, from leaving Los Angeles, however long you can at the stretch? I imagine you, you're kept here quite a lot of the time right now. But what does what does going as far away as you can teach you about here? Well, I have not had I've not officially had a vacation since Hidden LA went viral. So uh, I'm longing for one really, really badly. But I've tried. What I've tried to do is because um, I've been to about 23 countries, and I love traveling. And one of my favorite things has always been I love to go to a country where I don't speak the language, I don't know anything, and just sit and you know eat some bread and sit on the you know in a park or whatever, and just watch people. And listen to how people interact, and just observe the way the city works. You are the ultimate outsider at yeah, that moment. I, I'm, yeah, I like kind of feeling like I'm invisible, and this is kind of a similar thing. I, I kind of walk around and feel like I'm invisible as I'm watching how things work. And it's what's great is I've gotten such new perspectives, and I've met people and learned histories that I never would have done. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of families in L.A. that have been here since the 20s or 30s and businesses that are still here and still run by the families. You know, they're not all closing. No matter what anybody says, they're not. There's a lot of businesses here. There's a lot of businesses, but a lot of them that are real Angelino businesses. And um, places like Papa Cristo, which is... Um, I, I love Papa Cristo. He's, he's, he's my buddy. And, um, you know, you just, you just kind of... I love going to these places and just observing the way that I would if I was in another country and giving the city a chance the way I would. You know, when you go to a place that is foreign to you, you don't go there instantly judging it. 
you know, I, I, you, you will just walk down streets and you'll just stare and you'll just observe and window shop and absorb. And that is a great, this is a great place to do that. This is just a great place to do that. That said, what's one of your favorite ways to outsiderize yourself here in Los Angeles? A technique to just get yourself into the outsider's perspective for a moment or a day or however long you need. I, I really recommend the picking a street, parking, and walking. Um, I, I really recommend that because I, I have a tendency, you know, there, there are people who are, are, are scared of, um, like, well, for example, I, I was doing these scavenger hunt tours of Little Tokyo for a while. And the whole point was I would, I would give people these little haiku lists and they had to go around and figure out what the haiku was leading them to and go in the stores. And I'm like, I don't care if you get the answers right. What I care about is that you walk in, go in the stores, look around, just explore and don't be scared. And it's like they needed this this little you know list of haiku things to give them a reason to walk into a store and wander and look and i had a couple ladies say to me once they had this they had this really great time but they didn't expect it because they thought that people would be mean to them why would they be mean to them because they'd never been to little tokyo and they were from some other part of town and they had this idea that People in Little Tokyo would look at them and go, you know, like invasion of the body snatchers. Go, you know, and, Not from around here, yeah, are you're you? an outsider. Go away. <laughs> Not really realizing they're shopkeepers. They have a job to do, and they're selling stuff. And you're coming into their store. And also, the other thing is, that people generally are really nice if you're nice to them. If you walk towards people and if you walk around with this, you're going to hurt me look on your face. No, people aren't going to be friendly to you. It's again, you get what you put out there, and it's just it's it's a great thing to just walk around, explore, have a smile on your face, and you'll find these adventures, and you'll find these things you never knew existed. I've been speaking here at the top of the Hotel Wilshire with Lynn Garrett, proprietor of the very popular Facebook community and website, Hidden Los Angeles. Hidden LA, if you prefer. Either way works, doesn't it? Both work. Both work. Lynn, thank you so much. Thank you very much. This has been Notebook on Cities and Culture. I've been Colin Marshall. You can keep up with the cultural creators, internationalists, and observers of the urban scene on the show at colinmarshall.org. Thanks. Special thanks to everyone who backed Season 4 on Kickstarter, including Joel Neville Anderson, Daniel Levin Becker, Paige Calvert, Commander Manvark, Jonathan Crow, John Cunningham, David Dawes, James DeVito, Tim Dobbs, Paul Doyle, Jake Elliott, Kevin Emmett, Lawrence English, Jonathan Filbert, Andrew Philippone Jr., Michael Fransky, John French, Themistocles Ducrucius, Will Graham, Umberto Grant, Samuel Hansen, David Hayes, Jeff Hilnbrand, Mark Hines, Andrew Johnstone, Tadeusz Andrzej Kudlubowski, Peter Kavanaugh, Ted Kane, Andy Cooney, Evan Landman, Alfred Lee, James Maloney, John McDonald, Alberto Bruzos Moro, Jason Miller, Rob Montz, Daniel Murphy, Richard Nash, Aidan Nolman, Patrick O'Flaherty, Michael O'Regan, Christopher Porter, MJ Pritchett, Piers Rippey, Rob Schultz, Todd Shimoda, Cam Smith, Deborah Smith, Adam Sutherland, Maureen Kincaid-Speller, Anna Traher, Thomas Unterberger, Matt Warren, Nick Weigelt, Dion Wolf, Cynthia Yang, and Wayne Wright.